so I do have something that I feel like, amen, I need to share with you. So how many believe the Word of God can change your life today? Can I hear an amen? So you are part of the frozen chosen. Amen. And so today, because of that, I believe the Lord is going to speak to all of us, whether you're here or online. The Lord is going to speak to you today. So I invite you to turn with me to the book of Joshua, chapter number one. And we started this series last week, and uh, I am excited to travel through the book of Joshua with you on the um, beginning stages of 2024, because I believe that there is a lesson to be learned from Joshua for all of us as we travel uh, through this historical book in the Old Testament. Joshua chapter number one, and I'm going to read the same passage that I read last week, although we're going to deal with the second half of this passage rather than the first, uh, which we did last Sunday. So I invite you to stand, amen, for the reading of God's Word this morning, book of Joshua, chapter number one, and uh, I'm going to begin reading in verse number one, Joshua chapter one, verse number one, amen. Now, here's the deal. Everybody's going to have to say amen twice as loud today. Can you do that? There you go. Absolutely. Amen. Joshua chapter 1, verse number 1. Now, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, who was Moses' minister, and said, Moses, my servant is dead. So therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all the people, to the land that I give them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot treads on, that have I given to you, as I said to Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon to the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea toward the going down of the sun to shall be your coast. There will not be any man be able to stand against you before you all the days of your life. Because as I was with Moses, I will be with you. I will not fail you. I will not forsake you. So be strong and of a good courage because unto this people, you're going to divide for an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. So only be strong and very courageous, so you may observe to do according to the law, which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Turn not from it to the right or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. One more verse. This book of the law will not depart out of your mouth, but meditate therein day and night, so that you can observe to do according to everything written therein, because then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Amen. How many of you believe in 2024 to be a year of success? Let me hear you shout, Amen. 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 It's going to be. It's going to be. Amen. You can be seated in the presence of the Lord. So this is a series that we have entitled, entitled Possess the Land. Possess the Land. And our goal is to travel through with Joshua in this transition of the Israelites out of, out of the wilderness, out of that season of complaining and griping, out of that and into the promises and the land that God had given to the Israelites. Now, let me ask you, how many in this room and online, how many know there are some promises that God has made to you that it's time that you possess? Let me hear you shout amen. 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 It is. And this is the year to possess it. This is the year to go after it. I said it last week. There's something very special about 2024. This is the year that you are to go after everything that God has promised you. And my objective today is to lead you and, and, and throughout this series into principles on how you can do that, how you can actually possess the things that God wants you to possess. And I believe that if you will follow the strategy that is outlined in the book of Joshua, amen, this is the year you will actually possess some things that have been missing from your life that God wants you to have. I firmly believe that. I feel like this is the way that God wants us to start the year, and I'm going to deliver to you everything I can. I'm going to deliver you my heart every single Sunday because I want you to get there in Jesus' name. Amen? 
Amen. Now, when I was a kid, my dad used to take us to his mom's house, my grandma's house. She was Amish and came out of the Amish background. And, and when I would go to my grandma's house, and I loved her dearly, she was very, very good to us. But there was one thing that I remember as a kid as I sat in my grandma's trailer, my grandma's house, and we would sit there for seeming, when you're, when you're eight years old, how many know 20 minutes seems like 20 hours? Because we would just sit there, and the one thing about my grandmother, who I know is in heaven, but for the entire night, we would hear about all the things that she regretted in life. And it was like this tirade, not tirade, conversation of all the things that she wishes she would have done differently, how she wishes she would have raised her kids differently, how she wishes she would have done this or done that. And as an eight-year-old sitting there, it's like, you know what? I got better things to do with my time than listen to all of your regrets. And I thought about that as I was preparing this message that, that came to my mind and maybe it's a, you know, maybe it's a family trait because I know that, you know, I have that tendency as well. But I really thought, you know what? This year is the year that you and I, we need to put all of our regrets behind us once and for all. All the woulda, shoulda, coulda, I wish that I could have, I wish that I did, I wish that I didn't. All of those things need to be put behind us once and for all, and it's time to move forward and possess the land that God has promised. Can I get somebody to agree with me on that? Amen? This is the year. This is the time. Now is the moment. I feel very, very passionate about that. So when I look at Joshua, that's exactly what happening. He's leaving behind 40 years of complaining, a generation that lived in griping and moaning and complaining and regret. He's leaving all of that behind him once and for all, and he is crossing the Jordan, and he's taking people into the promised land. Now, 40 years is a long time to be wandering around in circles. In fact, when I looked up the wilderness in which the Israelites wandered, it was only about 250 miles from from north to south, and about 145 miles from east to west. Now, imagine walking around in that small area of land for 40 years. How many believe that would get pretty frustrating? I mean, the state of Indiana is only 250 miles from north to south, and about what is it? About 100, I'm sorry, 145 miles from east to west. And so the wilderness was 175 miles from east to west. So it's about the same size as the state of Indiana. Imagine walking in the same place for 40 years. How many believe you would get pretty frustrated? You ever been on a trip with your kids and you're like an hour into the trip? What's the question that comes from the back seat? Are we there yet? Imagine your kids asking you that for 40 years. Are we there yet? It's like you want to say no. The answer, the same answer was 40 years ago. We're not there yet. And we're not ever going to get there. Because that entire generation died in the wilderness. And Joshua was leading a new generation into the promised land. Church, what I'm telling you this morning is this. It's time to leave the complaining, the regrets, and remorse in the wilderness and let it die once and for all. And let's walk into what God has promised for us. Can I get a witness and shout amen? That's where we are. And so last week, I gave you three principles. God told Joshua, he said, Moses, my servant is dead. So the first thing is you got to bury what was. The second thing that I gave to you last Sunday was simply this. He said, so therefore, get up and go over this Jordan. Number two, we had to face our Jordan. And then verse three, every place that the sole of your foot treads on, I've given to you. My third point last week was that God's promise has already been activated in your life. And so here we go. As we move into 2024, there are some massive changes that God is bringing into your life. Just like Joshua 
but you are embarking on a journey that might bring up some fear, might bring up some unwariness about where you are going, but with the massive changes, God's faithfulness is going to be there every step of the way. So let's take now the next verse of this study, and I want to share with you these principles. Now, this may not be exegetically uh, correct, and it may not be cute and fancy terminology. I'm going to state to you what I feel like God is telling Joshua. Is that okay with you? So here we go. Verse 4, this is what the Lord told Joshua. He said, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, even to the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and to the great sea toward the going down of the sun will be your coast. Now, God is very specific about giving the dimensions and the boundaries of the land that he had given to Joshua. Look at that. He specified this is where you are to go, the coast of the Euphrates all the land of the Hittites. This is a very specific place that the Lord has promised. Now, with that, I tell you this. Number one, you need, I need to be very intentional about the land. Everybody say the word intentional. Come on, say it again. I need to be intentional. In other words, I need to be very specific about where I am going in this year, just as God told Joshua. It's not some vague promise that God gave to him. He said, no, this is what I have prepared for you. Now, I want you to write down this statement in your notes here. You cannot possess something that you do not know exists. You cannot possess something that you do not know exists. And the reason that I feel like that is important for you to know is this. Many of us live very vague, ambiguous lives. I mean, we get up in the morning and we simply accept everything that comes our way. We never set any type of vision. We never set any type of focus. And we simply live life the way that everybody on Instagram and everybody on Facebook and everybody on uh, TikTok and everybody else that is telling us how we are to live, how we are to dress what we are to eat, what we are to do. We model our lives off of the profiles of everybody else. And how many know those profiles, 90% of them are fake? And so most of what is being done in our lives is based on the expectation that everybody else has for us. And my exhortation to you as your pastor is this. Do not allow the social trend of the world to define where you go. Because how many know God has already defined what is possible in the life of the believer through the written word of Almighty God? Do you believe it? Shout amen. Amen. This now is the guide. This is the focus. This, everything that the Lord has said in his word is where you and I need to strategically focus our lives. Now, when you look at what Paul said, look at Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number 12. You know this well, but the word of God, Paul said, is quick. It is powerful. What that literally means is the word of God is living and it is active. How many know this is a living word? Amen. This is not a historical book. These are not dead words written on pages. This book is alive in the life of a believer. And he said it is quick. It is powerful. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. Now look at this. He said because it pierces even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. How many know you have a soul? And how many know you have a spirit? Your soul is your emotions. It is your feelings. It is your thoughts. And what Paul is saying is, do not live your life based on an emotional response, because how many know your feelings can lead you astray? How many know your thoughts can lead you astray? But he said, when you come to the word of God, it is the word of God that is alive that separates you from that solical man. And now you live in the realm of the spirit. And in the realm of the spirit, how many know everything is possible because God breathed it into existence? Amen. 
Because again, when you look at how the word of God, amen, came into existence, we know 2 Timothy 3, again, Paul is the author. He said, all scripture is given by inspiration. Now, I put up here the English Standard Version because I like that it says all scripture is breathed out by God. I want to pause there. Think about the power of the Word of God knowing this is the breath of God that breathed on the authors. In fact, Peter said it like this. Look at this verse. Peter said that the prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Now, one translation actually said they were carried by the Holy Ghost. In other words, uh, Paul and Peter and John and Mark and, and, and Moses and all the writers of Scripture, there they were, and suddenly the Holy Ghost breathed on them. And suddenly they were carried out of the realm of the natural, and they were carried into the realm of the supernatural, and they wrote, amen, as the Spirit of God breathed on them. How many believe every word in this book is a revelation of the heart and the mind of Almighty God? Do you believe that? Shout amen. Amen. This is not some, amen, archaic, prophetic, religious, new age philosophy. This is the breath of the creator of the universe, that same breath, that same breath breathed into Adam when he was just dust of the ground, and that same breath, that ruach, that breath of God brought life unto Adam. I tell you that because when you open the Word of God, the breath of God breathes into your spirit man, and now suddenly that which was dead, how many know it becomes alive because this is the breath of Almighty God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Now, I say that. Because I believe the Lord is wanting you to be very specific and lay aside the emotional side of you that has been guiding, amen, the goals of your life and start getting into the spiritual side and realize that if God breathed it, then it is possible for my life. Because Jesus said, Mark chapter 9. I'm trying to slow down here, but I'm pretty excited about what I'm telling you. Mark chapter 9, verse 23, Jesus said, if you can believe. Everybody shout, I believe. Come on, say it again. I believe. Say it again. I believe. If you believe, he said, all things are possible to them that believe. Glory to God. Today, right now, in this moment, we are taking unbelief and we are casting it out because unbelief is from the devil. And we are saying, Lord, if you breathed it in your word, breathe it into my spirit and I believe that it will become alive in me. Do you believe it? Shout amen. Glory to God. So how many by uplifted hand can say, Pastor, today is the day that I'm moving from the wilderness of unbelief into the promise of supernatural faith. Let me hear you just shout amen to that. Now, let me ask you this. Do you believe that the same Holy Ghost that breathed on Paul to write his epistles is still breathing on you today. Do you believe that? Now, you, yes or no? Because if that is true, then like Paul was breathed on by the Holy Ghost and literally carried into the realm of the supernatural to write out what God wanted him to write out, 
How many believe that God can do the same through the Holy Ghost to you, to breathe on you and carry you into the realm of the supernatural so that you can write out what God has planned for your life? Do you believe yes or no? Absolutely. Because the Holy Ghost has never changed. He's still the same today that he was 2,000 years ago. And so here now is where the Lord... Now look at, look at what Paul said to the Corinthians. Check this out. He said to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 2, the reason that I just told you what I told you, because you do not yet know everything that God has planned for your life. You don't know it yet. Because the Bible said, I have not seen, ear hath not heard, neither hath it entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Now, let me ask you this question. How many believe there are things that God has yet prepared for you in your life that you've not yet attained? Let me hear you shout amen to that. There are things ahead of you. There are things in your future. And I know for me, amen, I have not yet attained what I know that I am capable of attaining. I have not yet attained everything that I know God has planted within me. It was said of Dr. Summerall, amen, when he was in his, when he turned 50 or in his 50s, everybody said, you're done, you're finished, it's over. But the bulk of the success of ministry came after everybody said you were done and you're finished. How many believe when the world says you are done, God is only giving getting started. And I believe that the rest of your life is going to hold the best of what God can bring into your... You've got to believe that now. You are not done. I don't care what you've been through. I don't care what you've done. I don't care where you've been. Amen. You are just now getting started. And this year is the inception. It is the genesis. It is the beginning of doors beginning to open into your life. Because how many know God is not done? As long as you're breathing, God's not done. Amen. Amen. It's the truth. So because now we don't know that, look back in this verse, verse 10. We don't naturally know yet what God has prepared for us, but he's revealed them unto us by his spirit. Because the spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. What man knows the things of a man, save the spirit of man, which is in him. Even so, the things of God knoweth no man, but the spirit of God. In other words, I believe that the Holy Ghost wants to breathe on you, and he wants you now to be carried into that realm of the supernatural so that he can show you the things that God has prepared for your life. How many would like to know what God's got ahead of your life? Amen. He wants you to know that, but it is by the Spirit. It is not in the natural. It is not by you creating a vision board or reading a book or, you know, any of that. It is by you getting into the Holy Spirit. And as the Spirit moves on you, then you begin to see. Now, here's the next thing. Just as Paul, Moses, John, Mark, as they were carried by the Holy Ghost, what did they do? They wrote. They wrote. They wrote so that you and I on this frigid January morning could read what God had downloaded into their spirit. And so what I am exhorting you this morning is this. Get into the realm of the spirit and allow the Holy Ghost to begin to move on you to write what God has prepared for the rest of your life. I believe that the Lord can lead you to write a vision for your life. Habakkuk, the Bible said this. He said, write the vision and make it plain upon the tables because the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and not lie. In other words, when you begin to put pen to paper and you begin to write out the vision of your life, how many know the anointing, amen, can give you the power to run and chase after that vision? 
And when you write it out, it becomes very plain, not just to you, but to all those that are around you. Now, look at the rest of this verse. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, and it will not tarry. Listen, there are things that I know that God has begun to move on you with that have not yet come to pass. But brother, sister, do not grow weary in well-doing. How many know God is going to be faithful to bring that vision to pass? If you believe that, let me hear you shout a robust amen this morning. So this is the year. This is the year. You start writing out the vision for your relationships, the vision for your ministry, the vision for your business, the vision for your marriage, the vision for your finances, the vision for your health. And you begin to write it out. And you begin, amen, by the Spirit to begin to believe that if it's in the Word of God, it is possible for you. And then as you write it out, then you verbally declare that, amen, by faith. Because again, how many know faith? Faith has a power within it that causes you to speak that those things that be not will come to pass because you speak it as though it already exists. That is what faith is all about. Does everybody understand what I'm saying today? Am I making sense to you? It's time to write it out. Look at your neighbor say, just write it down. Just write it down. Amen. Just write it down. And then as you write it down, then you need to begin to speak it out. You need to begin to verbalize it because faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word, the spoken word of God. And as you speak that over your life, you are cultivating a level of belief that is going to launch you in. Oh my God, somebody just got it. I feel the break in the spirit. And this is the turning point of your life. Do you receive that this morning. Amen. So write it down. Write it down. Now, James said, why don't you have it? He said, you have not. Why? Because you ask not. So this is a year you stop putting your finger to the wind and determining what kind of life you're going to live based on the social wind that is blowing the, the emotional wind of your soul, and you put your book, amen, in front of you, and you begin to take the promises of God and write them out. This is the year. Now, let's move on, number five, or verse number five. So he said, this is the border. Be very intentional. And my point with that is for you to really narrow your focus into the areas of life that God wants to move. And you write them out. You begin to verbalize them. Now, number two, look in verse five. He said, no man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. So just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you and I will not leave you and I will not forsake you. Now, when I read this scripture and, and, and I was in my office this week, as I was reading this scripture, I literally out loud said, God, why did you have to tell Joshua that? How many know everything that is written has a reason? There's a reason that the Lord had to come to Joshua and say, Joshua, there's not going to be one man that is going to be able to stand against you. Obviously, there had to be a level of fear within Joshua. He's doing something he's never done before. He's leading millions. He's leading this mass of people into a land that they have never been. And as he's leading this mass of people, he knows that there's going to be enemies on the other side of Jordan. And these enemies are the same ones that he, Caleb, and the other 10 spies saw in Numbers 13 when they went back and they spied out the land. They went in, and the Bible says in Numbers chapter number 13 that those people, verse 28, they were very great. They saw the children of Anak there and the Amalekites, and so on, and so on, and the Canaanites. And not only were they that, but now look in verse 32, pull this up. Not only were they enemies, but they were also, the Bible said, giants. They were men of great stature. 
And verse 33, the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. Now, I... I would love some time to teach on, you know, the giants of the Bible, but I firmly believe that there was Nephilim, there was giants in the Bible. And these giants literally, as you look historically, were anywhere from seven to ten feet tall. One of these giants, the Bible said, had six fingers on each hand. Now, how many would like to be downtown South Bend and meet a 10-foot-tall, six-fingered giant in a back alley? These guys were powerful. They were big. They were scary. And Joshua knew that on the other side of Jordan, this is what he was going to be facing. And that's why God said, no man is going, I don't care how big he is, I don't care how ugly he is, I don't care how powerful he is, no man is going to be able to stand against you. Joshua, you don't have to worry about what you saw because you are going to overcome. Number two, the thing that you need to do secondly is this, release the intimidation from other people release it. Everybody say, let it go. Come on, say it again. Let it go. Let it go. Listen, I realize we don't live in the land of giants anymore. I know there's some basketball players that are like seven foot two, seven foot four, but they're not giants like they were in the Bible. But how many know spiritually there are giants that are standing in your way? Show of hands, how many know that? There are people whose words are like giants. I mean, they are words of criticism. They are words that demoralize you. And they look in, they look in your face and they find fault with everything that you do. They make you feel bad for everything, amen, that goes wrong in the world. They make you feel like you are not good enough. They make sure they let you know how much better and how much smarter they are than you. Anybody ever encountered this before? And they're making sure that when you begin to progress and you begin to move into the plan of Almighty God, amen, they are making sure that you are not going to get there because they will control you, they will manipulate you, they will send you text messages that try to stand in your way, they will again try to demoralize your character, they will make false accusations against you, they will put unrealistic expectations upon you, and these are the enemies and the giants that you are going to have to face. Am I talking to anybody in this room this morning? How many have encountered this in life? Amen. These are the kind of giants that you are going to have to face. And that is why you are here. That is why you are watching. It's because I'm here to tell you what God told Joshua. No giant is going to be able to stand in your way. And the control and the manipulation, God is going to give you the wisdom and the power to maneuver through that and to overcome it. And you are going to get into this land and there's nobody that is going to stand in the way of you possessing what God has given to you. Can I hear a faith-filled amen this morning? Amen. amen. Glory to God. Now, here's why. Because the Lord told Joshua, he said, the reason this is going to take place is because just like I was with Moses, I'm going to be with you. In other words, Joshua, it's not you. This is not about, how many know this is not your battle to fight? Oh, come on. I said, how many know this is not your battle to fight? It's like the Lord told Jehoshaphat. He said, the battle is not yours. God said, the battle is mine. 
Paul said, we wrestle not, Ephesians 6, against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and, and, and the rulers of the... Listen, this battle against control and this battle against manipulation and this battle against, uh, you know, all the things that people are trying to minimize and trying to, uh, trying to uh, just make your mind feel as if you're... That is a spirit uh, that is behind those people. Uh, and how many know in the realm of the spirit, uh, God is going to fight this battle for you and all you've got to do is say, Lord, I'm moving ahead. I'm not looking behind. I'm not looking to the right, to the left. I'm not listening to the giants. I am hyper focused on where I am going and I'm going to get there in Jesus name. Can I get somebody to give me a big amen on that? <laughs> Glory to God. How many believe that right now? Hallelujah. I feel the Holy Ghost right now. I said, how many believe that? But here's the deal. You've got to focus on where you are going. And you've got, to, you've got to stop listening to the giants that are trying to fight you through the words that they speak. And you cannot let the discouragement that is attached to those words get in your spirit. Amen. Listen. Amen. We're living in the realm of the spirit this year, not the soul. And we are not going to let, amen, the discouragement from the giants get into us. Because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Amen. Somebody get what I'm just saying right now. So you're going you're gonna to leave this place, you're going to leave where you are, and you're going to go out, and there's going to be a big, ugly giant that is going to stand in your way. There's going to be a big, ugly giant that is trying to stalk you. There's going to be a big, ugly giant that is going to try to minimize your passion and your dreams. But I believe that I'm leading a group of people. Amen. They're going to look at that giant and say, in the name of Jesus, just like David, he comes at Goliath and said, you're coming to me with uh, swords and spears. You can look at that giant and say, you're coming to me with gossip. You're coming to me with slander. You're coming to me with all kinds of false accusations. You're coming to me with lies. You're coming to me with all this stuff. But David said, I am coming to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. And he took the five, he took the five stones out of the brook and it just took one stone because the power of God, amen, only one time it takes for you to stand in the presence of Almighty God and the giant of gossip and the giant of slander and the giant of criticism and the giant of false accusation is going to fall in Jesus name and you're going to be like David and take the sword of Goliath, use his own sword and cut his head off for the glory of God. Somebody shout amen. That sounds horrible. I know. I'm not talking literally. But how many know you got to cut the head off of the snake in order for that snake to, oh, come on, somebody. It's too cold to go home anyway. How about we just camp out here for a while? You need to cut the head off of the snake. And you have allowed the giant to speak into your life too long. You have allowed the giant to make you feel like you're not enough. Brother, you are enough. Sister, you are enough. And the reason you're enough is because you're like that 17-year-old David who is scrawny, can't even wear the king's armor. It's too big for him. But you've got the Lord of hosts on your side. I said, you have the Lord of hosts on your side. And you are going to come out of this battle and the giant is going to lay dead and all of Israel is going to come around and proclaim the victory in Jesus' name name. Do you believe it? Shout amen. amen. Glory to God. How many know what I'm talking about this morning? <laughs> amen. So no man is going to stand in front of you. So you need to release. Let go. 
of the intimidation that that giant is trying to inflict on you. Let it go. Now, that applies maybe in the ways that I talked about, maybe in other ways in your life. I don't know what it, how, how, how it looks like in your life, but you need to let it go. And there is such power when you release that into the hands of God. I tell you what, Wednesday night, we had such a, such a powerful time around the altar as we just let go of a lot of stuff. And I can't wait for this coming Wednesday. There's more that I got to share with you about, you know, about your authority and what God's given to you in this Wednesday series at 7 o'clock. But there's power when you let it go. How many know there is a peace that comes because intimidation is no longer pushing the potential? That's what intimid that's the purpose of intimidation. It is to push the potential that God has put inside of you to push that down. When people try to intimidate you, it's because they are squatters on your land. These giants are living in the land that belongs to Israel. They're squatters. They don't belong there. And that's why Joshua, Joshua, they're not going to stay there because that belongs to you. Listen to me. The reason that people try to intimidate you is because you're moving in on their territory. But that's not their territory. How many believe this is your land in Jesus' name? And so therefore, you've got to release that intimidation. Now, number three. I promise I'll quit. Look at this. Look at this. Verse six. He said, so, he said, be strong and of a good courage. He, cause, he said, because to this people... You will divide for an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give to them. Now, number three, you need to live daily with intrepidity. Now, that's a big word that just simply means courage. To be intrepid means that you live with courage. Joshua, you've got to be strong. I don't care how you feel. I don't care whether you feel as if you are qualified to do this or not. You've got to be strong and you've got to have courage. Now, how many times did God tell Joshua that? When you look at the text, you will count that the Lord told Joshua that three times. There's a significance of the number three in the Bible. There are three members of the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. Peter denied Jesus three times. God called to Samuel in the Old Testament three times. Jesus chose three to be in his inner circle, Peter, James, John. The ministry of Jesus on earth lasted for three years, so three has a significance. And I believe the Lord had to tell Joshua that three times simply so Joshua would understand, amen, that this confidence, three is a number of completeness. This confidence has to be complete. It has to be what defines you moving forward. Because as I said before, Joshua had to have a level of fear. He's moving into something that he has never moved into. And I'm going to say what I said on the front end. 2024 is a year of massive change in your life. And there are things as you see that change that will bring that fear and will bring that uncertainty. But what I'm saying to you is that there is a level of divine confidence that I believe the Lord wants to bring to you by the Holy Ghost that no matter the amount of fear that you feel, how many know there is a level of supernatural confidence that God can give to you? How many can receive that right now and say amen? challenges that you face assignments that you face are bigger than what you have ever done and bigger than what you have ever faced come on team because notice that in verse 6 that Joshua's assignment is tied to the statement of being strong and of good courage 
He said, be strong and of good courage because to this people you will divide for an inheritance. In other words, the assignment, and this is what I have to tell you, that God has given to you this year is going to require, it is going to demand that you step into a level of divine courage and divine strength. And there's no reason for you to in any way back away from that. Because I believe the Lord is going to give you more than enough courage to do what he has called for you to do this year. And I realize that some of you have come into the new year weakened. Some of you have come into the year possibly bruised. Some of you have come into the year with your faith has been browbeaten by what you have gone through in life. And I know that I'm speaking directly to someone right now. Your faith really is at a low. And I don't say that in any way judgmentally. I say that only to let you know that as we launch into this year, as we begin this year, I believe that the more time you spend in the Word of God and the more time you spend in the presence of God, suddenly your faith is going to begin to rise. And out of the end of this year, there's going to come a man and there's going to come a woman that's going to be totally different than the man or the woman that is sinning under the sound of my voice right now. And you're going to look back at a man, you're going to look back at a woman as you stare at yourself in the, in the mirror. And you're going to see somebody that is totally different. And I'm speaking by the Spirit right now. This year, amen, it's not going to be the same as last year or the last 10 years. This year is going to build up something inside of you that is going to bring a massive radical change into your life because I believe there is a radical massive faith that is going to rise inside of you that's going to cause you and create within you the ability to do things that you have never done. This is the year. How many believe that? Let me hear you shout amen.